Welcome, everyone. I'm uh, Tim Fry, the director of the Harriman Institute. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming on a, a beautiful Friday morning. I hope you have a chance to take in the views and uh, uh, from up here. This is one of the places where we really like to hold uh, events. Um, I, I just want to say uh, a few words for those of you who might not know much about uh, the Harriman Institute. We're the uh, oldest institute for the study of the, former, of the Soviet Union uh, and Eastern Europe in the United States, founded in 1946. Uh, in the early 1980s, thanks to a very generous grant from the Harriman family, uh, the Russian Research Center was renamed uh, the Harriman Institute. Uh, and we continue to receive generous support from the Harriman family, and, and for that we're very uh, thankful. In the mid-1990s, we merged with the East Central Europe uh, Center. Uh, so we now have a scope of uh, 28 countries of the former uh, Soviet Union. We work broadly with lots of institutes and centers uh, across Colombia and across uh, New York City. Um, most people don't know, but our biggest uh, funding item is fellowships for students studying at Columbia, uh, both in the MA program and in the PhD program. Uh, we do a lot of events, about uh, 100 or 125 a year, from brown bag seminars to conferences like this. And we uh, do everything, uh, as I say, from uh, guns and bombs to ballet. It's a very uh, interdisciplinary center. And uh, we like events like this uh, that um, uh, really bring together people with very diverse backgrounds to look at pressing policy issues. Uh, one of our missions at the Institute is to inform the policy community based on our, our, our academic research and we've got I think a really terrific group of people with experience on both sides uh, of the aisle, both on the academic side and uh, on the policy side uh, for the event. I think this event is also uh, really good, very well timed in that it's 20 years since the, uh, uh, the, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union and in some might consider these frozen conflicts the illegitimate children of the, uh, of the revolutions of, of, of 1991. Uh, uh, so this gives us a chance not only to uh, look forward in terms of de uh, defining policy, but also to look backward to think, why has it taken so long to, to, to resolve these conflicts? Um, I want to uh, take just one second to, to thank uh, uh, Alex Cooley uh, and, and Lincoln Mitchell for doing all the hard work of, of organizing this conference. All I did was look at the budget and say, well, yeah, this is a great idea. Go ahead. Go do it. Uh, so they're really the ones who did all the heavy lifting on this, and I really want to thank them uh, publicly. So they, now let me turn the, the floor over to Lincoln, uh, who will introduce uh, the panelists, and I hope you all have, uh, have a great conference. Thanks. Welcome to everybody. We are looking forward to today's conference. We have, I think, a pretty strong and impressive group of speakers, ranging from diplomats to scholars to activists, people with a lot of experience in the region from a lot of different angles. So we're looking forward to three very good discussions. Um, a couple of notes on the program uh, and, uh, regarding the second panel. Svante Cornell is, is attending, the, is going to be speaking. He was inadvertently left off the final draft of the program, but he's here and he'll be, he'll be part of the conference, so, so don't, uh, don't worry. Um, on a perhaps more troubling note, Charles King has been unable to make it and he will be replaced by Lincoln Mitchell uh, from Columbia University. <laughs> Uh, we, as you can see, there are cameras here. The camera is from, uh, is from Columbia and we'll be filming this. This will be available on the Harriman website, on Columbia's website. Um, there may be other media here. They will not be filming the, the, the panels, but they will be speaking to participants afterwards, so feel free to talk to them. This is on the record, so, um, you know, if you want to tweet it or, or anything like that or live blog it, uh, please feel free. It's be good to get started on time, so I'm going to wrap up. But again, thank you for attending. We look forward to a very good day. Before I introduce our first panelist, I just want to give a special shout out to Lincoln Mitchell. Snyom Rajdenia, Lincoln. It's Lincoln's birthday. Happy Ooh. birthday, Lincoln. <laughs> So I think that the conference is extraordinarily timely given the events that are happening in these regions uh, recently and uh, we have a terrific starting panel of people who are truly excellent scholars and uh, excellent practitioners and policy advisors. Um, so I think we're just going to go in the order that they're listed here. So we'll start with Lawrence Brewers um, who uh, has worked uh, since uh, November 
I think it's 2008, it says 2084, <laughs> as a projects manager for the Caucasus program at the London-based NGO Conciliation Resources. He is an outstanding expert on Armenia, Azerbaijan, uh, and Georgia, and um, has just a terrific background in the region, and so we really look forward to what he has to say. Okay, can I speak from here? Sure, if you like. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to speak here. Um, and what I wanted to do with my presentation is to take advantage of the fact that I'm first up uh, to give an overview of the different approaches and phases of inquiry um, into uh, Eurasia's de facto states um, after, after, after the last two decades, and specifically um, what these different approaches have meant for discussions of governance um, and institutions in de facto states, or what I might uh, call shadow governance. So post-Soviet de facto states have presented over time a shifting and often elusive target um, of, for inquiry for several reasons. First, at, diff at different points uh, in the last 20 years, um, different questions have seemed primary. Longevity, internal processes, and the variable survival of de facto states have made new questions possible and relevant at different times. A second key obstacle is the politicization of any kind of inquiry regarding de facto states as inferring some kind of acceptance or legitimacy for these entities. A key tension, therefore, is the extent to which scholarly inquiry is able to navigate the imperatives emanating from key policy communities. And inevitably, there is much politicized academic work, both for and against specific de facto states. And because of this deep politici politicization, de facto states have traditionally been approached in terms of their relationships with a significant external other. And it's mm -hmm. only with time and survival that they seem to have earned the right to be a subject of inquiry um, on their own. So within this broader framework, um, the nature of governance um, in de facto states, uh, or shadow governance, is a theme that has crept up slowly uh, upon us. It has not always been possible to ask questions uh, about governance in de facto states, and with some audiences, um, it is still not possible. And the fact that we're doing this today um, is absolutely a, a testament to the durability uh, of de facto states, but perhaps not necessarily to the effectiveness or functionality um, of their capacities for governance. So de facto states um, across the world um, cope with a wide range of vulnerabilities um, associated with existence in the shadows, in the margins of the international state system. And many of these have negative impacts uh, for their governance and governability. Uh, and Eurasia's de facto states, uh, in particular, have been characterized by five key vulnerabilities um, relevant for discussions uh, about governance. And um, most of my comments do relate more to the, uh, the South Caucasus, um, which is the area that I know best. So the first of these vulnerabilities is the enduring association with Russia. Um, in the eyes of outsiders, Eurasia's de facto states um, have re rarely been able to shake off the aura of being imperial residue or of being pockets of Soviet nostalgia, tainted by association with unhappy traditions of Soviet governance. And this is especially the case where they have sought to preserve titular privileges um, that might have been dismantled had they remained part of newly sovereign uh, metropolitan states. It is also backed up by harder facts concerning the participation of populations in referenda for the preservation of the Soviet Union, as well as the well-documented military support extended by ethnic Russian military forces during the wars of secession. Among many other things, uh, this means that it is the former Union republics that have been able to claim the mantle of the post-colony, together with everything that that implies in terms of the legitimacy of secession and new international borders. A second uh, key vulnerability is that external support for de facto states rarely supports democratic uh, de facto states. Non-recognition constantly imposes on de facto states a struggle to prevent the subordination of their state-building project to wider outside goals, sometimes ideological, sometimes geopolitical, but usually unfriendly uh, to democratization. Russian support to Abkhazia and South Ossetia and to a more arguable extent, Armenian diaspora support to NK are not oriented towards democratization uh, outcomes in those territories. They are at best apolitical, at worst distinctly hostile. A third key vulnerability is of course the fact that Eurasia's de facto states were born in war, mostly fought on their, ter their own territory. And this has left multiple legacies ranging from the material destruction of landscape and livelihoods, the prominence of military figures in politics, sometimes doubling up as racketeers, the opacity of political partnerships forged in war and then carried over into the civil sphere, lingering states of emergency, and cults of the military, of unity and security, none of which are necessarily welcoming, of free and open political process. 
A fourth key vulnerability is uh, the legacies of displacement. The forced displacement of local communities belonging to the majority nation has meant that in the eyes of the wider world, the de facto states were born in sin. And this factor has served as a separate, mutually reinforcing justification for their isolation beyond their primary transgression of violating de jure borders. And this vulnerability distinguishes the de facto states in the South Caucasus uh, from Kosovo, for example. And it has allowed metropolitan states to plausibly ask, how can governing institutions uh, in de facto states be assessed as anything other than the institutional embodiment of mass human rights violations? It's worth, however, reflecting on the ethics um, of this position for a moment. Georgia, in the case of Ossetians outside of the South Ossetian Autonomous Oblast, Armenia and Azerbaijan all saw harassment, mass demographic flight, or deportation of whole co communities in the late 1980s uh, or early 1990s. But this has not prevented outsiders from engaging with these recognized republics. And what effectively transpired was that the internal ethnic contours of a society could be changed by force, but not its external territorial borders. And there is a, a kind of deficit uh, in this outcome, um, which has long been overlooked by the international community and has been deployed by those living in de facto states as grounds not to engage um, with legacies of displacement or the rights uh, of the communities displaced from their territories. So the fifth vulnerability that I wanted to mention um, is a strong association of de facto states uh, with an ethnic um, as opposed to civic discourse of national identity. Um, again, I think this distinction may be overplayed in the sense that clearly discriminatory de jure states in the post-Soviet space have been accepted into the international community. And there are also clear differences um, within uh, and among de facto states. Some have seemingly avoided this taint altogether, uh, Transnistria and Chechnya, while others have been left as practically mono-ethnic entities um, post-displacement. Uh, this is the case in Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, it is in Abkhazia where ac accusations of ethnocracy have resonated loudest, where titular Abkhazian claims and agendas must be negotiated not only vis-a-vis -vis Georgia and the outside world, but in relation to its own multi-ethnic uh, population. So I wanted now to um, try to chart out uh, perhaps three phases of inquiry um, into uh, de facto states. Um, and the arc that these phases describe is one of growing acknowledgement um, that governance in de facto states does matter, and taking an interest in it is not synonymous with support for separatism. Rather, this acknowledgement accepts the importance of shadow governance, um, not only in terms of internal outcomes, um, but also for political processes to resolve conflicts without prejudice for eventual, for eventual status. So the first phase, um, beginning uh, in the early 90s, um, when, when the, the de facto states first emerged, um, they, uh, it seems to me, entered social scientific inquiry primarily um, as scenarios of ethnic conflict. And the primary question um, that was posed um, was why these scenarios in particular ended in violence. And this phase perhaps lasted through to the end of the 90s. In terms of variables and theoretical frameworks, a number of studies looked at identity and cultural difference, institutions, relative deprivation theory, kin states or their functional equivalent, and nationalist mobilization theories. And governance in issues were generally sublimated into a wider analysis of dysfunctional uh, Soviet governance, although later studies did try to identify specific specificities in each case. So a dominant thread um, in this phase is the role of Soviet ethno-federal institutions in territorializing ethnicity, establishing politically salient parameters for intergroup comparison, and choking possibilities for institutionalizing conflict at the local level. Essentially, however, this was a, a, a more retrospective approach focused uh, on the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and engaging more with the formative matrix um, of de facto states rather than de facto states in and of themselves. The second phase uh, of inquiry um, loosely began perhaps at the end of the 90s and ran through to the uh, mid to late uh, 2000s um, when it had become clear that de facto states were not just ephemeral uh, phenomena. The demise of the de facto state in Chechnya also highlighted the possibility that internal governance outcomes could be significant in mediating a de facto state's survival um, or demise. And this second phase therefore began to engage um, in a more uh, rounded way with de facto states and identify different variables critical to their survival, um, such as the prominence of warlord armies, militarized political cultures, extent of multi-ethnicity, the extent and type of external support, and the political trajectory um, in the metropolitan state. This was also uh, post-2003, of course, the era of color revolutions, 
uh, a watershed moment in expectations of transition, and perhaps the apotheosis of Western receptivity to the discourse and outward signs of democratization. Um, and this uh, did not pass unnoticed um, in the de facto states who also began to deploy the language of governance and democratization to further their claims. They went to considerable lengths to demonstrate compliance with formal markers of democracy, regular elections, and procedural correctness to project a democratic <coughs> image to the outside world. But beyond uh, this more rhetorical deployment um, of the governance discourse, this phase was also linked to surprising political outcomes um, in de facto states, such as the 2004 presidential election in Abhazia and the mayoral election in Stepanakert uh, in the same year. And these testified to some inner dynamics um, that casual stereotyping about anarchical badlands was clearly missing. The third phase uh, followed on um, in the later 2000s to develop a fuller engagement with de facto states as political environments um, in their own right. Although keeping an eye constantly on the external dimensions of uh, de facto state building, third phase inquiry acknowledges the importance of internal dimensions and internal sovereignty. In this phase, de facto states have become the focus of inquiry, rather than being treated as the epiphenomenon of something else. But this third phase has been made uh, more complicated um, over the last three years um, by at least three factors. The first uh, was the recognition of Kosovo, which weakened the link between governance standards and recognition. And this outcome uh, has clearly influenced um, the calculus in de facto states thinking on whether their efforts to earn sovereignty um, through good governance will be rewarded. The second was the recognition of Abhazia and South Ossetia, which further decoupled any notional connection between recognition and standards to posit instead the recognition of de facto states as an act of aggressive geopolitics. The third was, the, was Sri Lanka's military defeat of the Tamil Tigers in May 2009 after 26 years of conflict. Well, this was uh, not, of course, the first time um, that a de facto state has been crushed militarily. The apparent totality of the victory and its packaging as a Sri Lankan model uh, of conflict resolution has compounded the challenges to an open discussion about shadow governance. So collectively, these developments have effectively offered both those in de facto states and those in metropolitan state states seeking to reintegrate them, uh, alternatives to difficult discussions about governance. Um, this context has deepened the challenges to facing both reformers in de facto states and advocates of governance as peace building. There is therefore a paradox that just as shadow governance was emerging from the shadows, a cluster of events took place lessening the prospects for increased political as opposed to scholarly engagement with shadow governance. In the case of Abhazia and South Ossetia, there are many now in Georgia who believe that even if engagement with Abhazian and South Ossetian governance and institutions was ever relevant, it certainly is not relevant now. In Abhazia, the attitude is, we will talk about governance if you ex accept the reality and talk about state building. Azerbaijan is perhaps less comfortable with the governance discourse than Georgia, or at least sees less need to engage with this discourse in a meaningful way. Right now, the space for meaningful discussion of governance and institutions in NK is being effectively closed off by strategies of belligerent rhetoric and military display. Armenians, meanwhile, see current governance outcomes in Azerbaijan as reason enough to see any discussion on these issues as completely cynical and remain oriented towards preservation of the status quo. So uh, to uh, begin wrapping up, it seems that we've reached um, a certain kind of impasse in talking about governance uh, in de facto states, in the South Caucasus at least. And in this context, um, it seems relevant to ask what new directions uh, can the study of shadow governance take um, uh, in the future? In the academic sphere, on a purely scholarly or theoretical level, there are intriguing questions uh, made possible um, by Russia's recognition of Abhazia and South Ossetia. Will this form of unilateral independence, or more accurately, unipolar uh, independence, sustain, increase, or decrease local governance capacities in Abhazia and South Ossetia? Will these entities become differentiated from NK and Transnistria because of this outcome? And what form will these differences take? What does a 21st century protectorate look like? And how might it differ from historical paradigms for this kind of political relationship? And how do Russian, as opposed to Western-supported protectorates, differ in the post-Cold War world? And what are the implications for long-term governance outcomes? Of course, we do not have the luxury of purely academic inquiry into de facto states. The most pressing reason to remain engaged and open to discussion of shadow governance is that outcomes of recognition, non-recognition, and even military reintegration do not make key problems and issues in the broader governance thematic disappear. 
Exploration of shadow governance is a necessary prerequisite for defining what the appropriate roles are for local governance capacities in long-term strategies for conflict resolution. For if there is one thing that we've learned from the past two decades, it is that isolation doesn't work. In this context, uh, it seems to uh, be relevant to ask, to what extent should models for resolving these conflicts accept as givens the institutions that exist today in de facto states? How can interim mechanisms be crafted in ways that accentuate governance dividends and de-emphasize status outcomes? And can the return of displaced people be realistically discussed without serious engagement with local governance and institutions in the territories to which some of them would return? Although arguments about puppet states suggest otherwise, it seems fairly clear that the Eurasian secessions could not have happened without local capacities. These local capacities, however we want to call them, therefore matter. And it also seems counterintuitive that resolution would be possible when there are vast deficits in governance capacities on either side of a conflict. Uh, that, because that also means uh, deficits in capacities to generate legitimate outcomes um, relating to conflict re uh, resolution. So we therefore need to remain attuned to shadow governance and we need to find new and innovative forms of engagement, balancing support with critical exposure and working to bring de facto states into a common governance paradigm structured by rights and responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you for that terrific analytical overview. I really like the way you put it in both comparative and historical perspective. That's a great opening for the conference. Um, now we'll turn to Dennis Samut, who has been an NGO expert working in the region for a couple of decades, currently at Lynx uh, in London. He's been recognized by the British government uh, for the work that he has done uh, on these issues. He's been a special advisor for parliamentary uh, uh, establishment and reform in both the South, South Caucasus and Afghanistan. Um, and uh, he was also a member of the Taliavini Commission. So, Dennis. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm grateful to Lawrence for actually uh, setting the, uh, the background to, to this discussion. Uh, the panel has not coordinated its papers, uh, by the way, so you may find that there will be some overlaps. Uh, but I think uh, the point that I'm going to make will complement rather than contradict uh, what Lawrence has just said. Well, the four self-declared republics that emerged in the non-Russian space of the former USSR after its disintegration have confounded skeptics and continue to exist 20 years later. They proudly display their embryonic state structures as proof of their success and durability as independent states. Whilst in the early 1990s, statehood was reflected in the form of a flag, a national anthem, and a national narrative, now they all have presidencies, parliaments, a military and a police force, a justice system, a foreign ministry, and as of 2008, two of them have also achieved partial international recognition and have embassies accredited to one of the permanent members of the UN Security Council. However, beneath the veneer of state symbols, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Nagorno-Karabakh, and Transnistria remain constrained in a straight jacket that is partly the result of their largely unrecognized status, but is also caused by problems of capacity, cohesion, and corruption. The four entities would not have survived without the support of their external patrons. Russia, as far as Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and Transnistria are concerned, and Armenia, as far as Nagorno-Karabakh is concerned. They not only provided the military wall behind which the embryonic states could grow, but they also provided other support in terms of money, personnel, passports, and other necessities needed for any organized society to operate. This support may have been cynically motivated, but this should not mean that it is not important to give consideration to the aspirations of the people who live in these territories uh, and to what they want to achieve. Simply dismissing the territories as artificial creations is not a proper reflection of the situation either. I want to uh, start, however, by uh, inviting you to have another look at this term 20 years after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, I think it is necessary to, la to look at the, at the past two decades not as a single phase, but three. The first is the phase between the formal end of the Soviet Union, 26 December 1991, and 9 August 1999, 
the day Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin became acting prime minister and de facto leader of Russia. The second race is from that day until 8th of August 2008, the day Russian troops intervened in South Ossetia, and the third phase is from that time onwards. Historians of the British Empire sometimes define the period between the independence of India in 1947 and the handover of Hong Kong in 1997 as the period between the end and the end of the end of empire. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is equally possible to define the period between 1991 and 1999 as the period between the end and the end of the end of the USSR. Despite the fact that the Union formally ceased to exist in 1991, both the Russian inner state as well as most of the politicians continued to consider the former Soviet space, with the exception of the Baltic states, as one whole, regardless of the constitutional niceties. This impacted enormously the way that they dealt with the issues of the so-called ethnic conflicts and the so-called near abroad. Whilst the Russian establishment perceived the emergence of the four self-declared republics as an important lever on the former Union republics from which they had emerged, supporting them was, in this period, in my view, not the ultimate objective, but only the means through which the large entities could be kept within the Russian orbit. In this regard, the policy in this period was an extension of previous Soviet policy. Russian policy towards the unrecognized entities was cautious, and support was covert rather than overt. The message from Moscow all the time was that Russia was an honest broker that would help sort out the problems perceived to be problems within the family. The advent of Putin as leader of Russia was the moment when Russian policy stopped being Soviet in its thinking and became more Russia-focused. The military operation in Chechnya launched within weeks of Putin's appointment was, was, was conducted together with efforts to secure the Russian borders. For the first time, there was an admission that the old Soviet borders did not matter and the threat could actually come from them as well. Ironically, therefore, it was Putin rather than Yeltsin that accepted that the Soviet Union had collapsed and that this was an irreversible process and that Russia's objectives and tactics now needed to change. An important change was in the approach of Russia towards the recognized entities. The gloves were off in dealing with the former Union republics. In the case of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, support for them became an end in itself. That Russia will act in the way it did during the Georgia-Russia war of August 2008 was therefore, at least with the benefit of hindsight, inevitable. The recognition of Abkhazia and South Ossetia by Russia soon after shows the extent to which Russia had given up on Georgia, not only as a possible partner in a common state, but even as a friendly neighbor. This then is the backdrop to what happened in the last two decades in the four entities themselves. Once the fighting had stopped in the initial uh, conflicts, and in the case of Abkhazia and South Ossetia and Transnistria, behind the safety of the protection that was offered by Russian peacekeeping forces, state structures began to be constructed. This process of state building has relied heavily on Russian support. In the case of Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and Transnistria, in the case of Nagorno-Karabakh, it has been Armenian support. There is no evidence to suggest direct Russian support for Nagorno-Karabakh. However, Nagorno-Karabakh Republic is supported uh, by Armenia, which in turn is heavily supported by Russia. The four entities, we have to keep in mind, had already during the Soviet system an internal administrative, administrative <laughs> structures. In the case of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, these were subordinate to the Georgian SSR. In the case of Nagorno-Karabakh to Azerbaijan SSR, in the case of Madhistra to Moldova SSR. Although it is as yet difficult to produce, to produce documentary evidence to support this, empirical evidence suggests that a high level of subordination to an outside party in return for financial and other support existed, at least in the case of South Ossetia and Nagorno-Karabakh from 1991 to 1999, namely towards the Republic of North Ossetia, Lania, in the case of South Ossetia, and towards Armenia with regards to the latter. 
Proximity of geography and the ethnic com communality between large and small entity made this, in a certain sense, natural. Russian material support could therefore also be channeled through the larger polities. In Abkhazia and in Transnistria, due to geography and other factors, Russia had no intermediary to play Big Brother, so this was largely played by Russian military, who continued to retain a significant presence in the troop. Uh, although Russian regions, such as Krasnodar Krai and the Republic <coughs> of Adygea, also played some role in this. The pattern of Russian support and overall Russian policy became more nuanced vis-à-vis -vis the four territories after 1999. Russian involvement became more overt in Abkhazia and South Ossetia as relations with Georgia deteriorated. Although in Transnistria, Russia continued to support the Raspol, there was also uh, an effort not to undermine the communist government of Vladimir Voronin that had took power in Moldova in 2001. In Nagorno-Karabakh, Russian support was channeled through the Republic of Armenia. The emergence of Robert Kocharyan as president of Armenia was a guarantee both of Armenia's strong relations with Russia, as well as its robust support for Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, of which Kocharyan was himself first president. Russia's intervention in the Georgian conflict in August 2008, regardless of what triggered them, were a logical conclusion of the policy pursued by Putin's Russia, which saw the support of Abkhazia and, to Abkhazia and South Ossetia as an end in itself, and not a means to an end. The recognition of their independence and the signing of long-term military agreements secured the Russian position and satisfied long-perceived strategic needs. The process of support to the development of the state institutions of the two territories is now official Russian policy, funded overtly to the main state budget. With regards to Karabakh and Transnistria in the third phase, Russia's task has been more complicated since, Russia's con since Russia continues to see the conflicts as ways through which it can exert leverage on the former Soviet republics concerned. Since 2008, therefore, Russia has been very active in the mediation process in the two, uh, 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 and has engaged positively with the international community on the issue of conflict resolution in the two territories. In Karabakh, due to its hands-off approach, the Russian engagement has been more elegant. In Transnistria, with a Russian military presence in place and the large disbursement of funds and direct budgetary support, the situation is somewhat more messy. I want now to talk briefly about the constraints of capacity, cohesion, and corruption. The, the, the four unrecognized states have operated over the last two decades in many ways uh, outside the international system. This has been a major constraint on their uh, the evolution and is often cited by the de facto authorities of these entities as a cruel approach of the international community to their humanitarian needs, economic potential, and political aspirations. There are, however, a number of other factors that have severely constrained the ability of the three polities to develop more than they have done so far. The three are capacity, cohesion, and corruption. It is sometimes easy when referring to the unrecognized entities to forget their size. Even in an ideal world where they would be normal members of the international community, these will be small countries with limited or no natural resources and, except for Abkhazia, landlocked territories and with small populations. According to the latest statistics produced by the de facto authorities, themselves, the population of the territories are as follows, and I have to read this out with a health warning, which is that these figures are always very contentious, and you will get several different versions of these figures, but for the purpose of this discussion, I think they are helpful because they are the maximum that these uh, territories claim that they have as population. So Abkhazia, according to 2003 census, 115,000, South Ossetia, 70,000, Nagorno-Karabakh, 138,000, and Transnistria for 555,000. These figures are highly contentious. They do not include people displaced by the conflict and may include people who do not normally live in the territories in question. They are giving, being given here as indicative only. However, even if one accepts these figures at face value, it means that the whole total population of the four territories combined is under one million people. 
The viability of the smallest of these entities, South Ossetia, ironically the first one to be recognized, would be questionable under any circumstance. This week we had a lot of news from South Ossetia and uh, our, we, we kept hearing uh, all these terms, President, Parliament, Supreme Court, Prosecutor General, uh, in Ministry of Interior uh, and uh, a lot of other uh, names and it reminded me of a small uh, incident. Uh, I was involved in January 1997 to bring the Chairman of the Parliament of South Ossetia to Tbilisi and uh, this had to be, you know, there were a lot, lot of negotiations uh, to, be, to be discussed uh, how to do this. And uh, in the end it was agreed that uh, we will go to Tbilisi with a, 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 a proper car convoy with security from the Georgian side, but that the Speaker of the Parliament will travel to Tbilisi in his own car, not in a car provided by the Georgian government. So this was acceptable, we accepted it, and uh, on, on the uh, day in question, I turned up in Skim Valley with uh, uh, a lot of people from Chevrolet Nazi security uh, and cars and so on to pick up the Chairman of Parliament. This was the, and has been, the highest level visit of a South Ossetian uh, politician to Tbilisi since the conflict uh, started in 1992. There, there were visits to other parts of Georgia, but not to Tbilisi. So we were taken to the office of the speaker and I, we sat down and he was there and everybody was there and I said, shouldn't we go? They said, please wait. And then after 10 minutes I said, shouldn't we go? They said, please wait. And I started getting very worried. Uh, and at one point I, got, I started getting angry. I thought this was some political ploy. Then one of the advisors of the speaker, uh, Kosta Kochiev, uh, came up to me quietly. He said, we have a problem. I said, what is it? He said, the car can't start. <laughs> and uh, this was, uh, you know, th this nearly kind of uh, disrupted the whole uh, process uh, because uh, they wanted to go with their own car, but the car of the Speaker of the South Ossetian Parliament was not uh, uh, a car that, 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 that could really do a long, a long uh, trip. I'm, I'm mentioning this story because it is very easy for all of us to forget when we start using these names, foreign ministry, uh, parliament, president, to think that of, of big things when this is, uh, you know, uh, uh, governance on a very small scale. Um, uh, and, you know, when, when we hear, and I think the, the, the Kremlin has just learned this lesson uh, this week in South Ossetia because uh, it dealt with it as if this was some kind of uh, big operation when in fact you, you were talking about 20, an electorate of 25,000 people, basically uh, half a dozen families all related to each other, and you needed to deal with that in a very different way than, than how the Kremlin has dealt with this. I, I, uh, I'm running out of time. I just want to go very quickly through, through the other two points, which is cohesion and corruption. Despite their size, the four entities have also serious problems of internal cohesion with serious internal divisions based sometimes on ethnicity and sometimes on clan rivalry. In the two larger entities, Transnistria and Abkhazia, the ruling Russian and Abkhaz elites have to contend with large populations of other ethnicities. In Transnistria, the largest ethnic group in the territory under Tiraspol's control is actually Moldovan, with Russians and Ukrainians making up the two other large ethnic groups. In Abkhazia, apart from the Abkhaz, there are large Armenian and Russian communities, and then of course there are the residents of Gali, probably around 60,000, who are Mangrelian Georgians. As a result of the conflicts, both South Ossetia and Nagorno-Karabakh are now quite crazy monoethnic. However, this does not mean that there are no problems of cohesion in these territories as well. In Nagorno-Karabakh, the attempt on the life of the president, Arkady Gukasian, in 2000, reflected a deep rift between different interest groups vying for control of the territory. And as the events in the last days in South Ossetia have shown, the small size of, of the community does not mean that the situation between rival clans that has existed for a long time uh, is, is a peaceful one, and it, the only difference is that it's now articulating itself in political terms leading to unforeseen developments. And finally, the third factor that stifles the development of the four entities is corruption. These territories have existed in this uh, uh, informal, uh, unrecognized status, and this has bred corruption 
on a big scale, even bigger than uh, one normally associates uh, with transition uh, countries, uh, and even bigger than with the sort of corruption that one normally associates with the South Caucasus at the moment. Uh, the fact that trade, most of it, had to be done uh, illegally through smuggling, and this was an existential issue, it was not simply a matter of choice, it had to be done like that, meant that different criminal groups emerged, they became very important, and they took a life of their own. Uh, and uh, uh, this is, uh, I think, a factor that we have to keep in mind. In recent years, as Russian economic aid has become larger and more direct, it has been one of the main targets of criminals also. Corruption and siphoning off of Russian aid was the main issue in the recent South Ossetian election, and similarly, a case involving the son of the Transnistrian leader, Igor Smirnov, accused of embezzling Russian aid, is also currently underway. In conclusion, despite attempts to give the impression of strong state institutions, the four entities have suffered from the isolation that they had to operate under. Russian assistance, in the case of Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and Transnistria, and Armenian assistance, in the case of Nagorno-Karabakh, has only partly alleviated the problem. Lack of capacity, lack of cohesion, and widespread corruption has kept the institutions weak. Without outside support, there is little hope that these entities will survive. However, these entities do reflect the aspirations of most of the people who currently live in them. Their collapse is not, in the long, is not essentially the long-term solution. The integration of Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Nagorno-Karabakh, and Transnistria somehow, in one form or another, back into the global international system needs to be the objective to which the international community has to work for. It is this form of integration uh, that is the challenge that has yet to be determined. Thank you very much, Dennis. I know that Dennis is working on a project to compare the end of the British Empire and the end of the Soviet Empire. So we got that theme, and hearing your, your stories really brought things to life. So thank you very much. Now we'll turn to Sergei Merkadanov, who is currently a visiting fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. He has a, a long history of being in various academic and uh, policy-related positions in uh, Russia, starting in Rostov. Um, and he's incredibly well published. Um, not only in Rostov. Not only in, in Rostov, Rostov, in Rostov, Moscow. In Moscow yes. Okay, okay. Nine, nine years experience. <laughs> okay. Um, and recently he has published a great deal uh, on the current events in South Ossetia, and I understand that that's what he wants to concentrate on in his comments today. Uh, thank you, Kim, for this solid PR promotion. I want to be puffed off, but it's time to make presentation. Uh, I wish to express my gratitude to my friends Alex and Lincoln for having me here as a speaker. I also wish to uh, thank uh, Harriman Institution for this kind of invitation. And uh, let me start on some uh, critical comments. I wish to touch the title of our conference. It's called Frozen Conflicts. I'm not sure that this uh, definition is uh, so optimal. Because frozen condition means absence of dynamics, both positive and negative. But we have negative dynamics in the case of Nagorno-Karabakh, growth of victims in the ceasefire zone from year to year. And we see the first case of reconsidering inter-republican border in 2008. I mean here recognition of Abkhazia and South Ossetia by Russia. It's not bad, it's not good. I am an expert, I am not a politician, but it, it has taken place. Uh, this is why we could speak about not frozen but protracted conflicts in Eurasia and this character of this conflict uh, allows us to uh, make one more provocative conclusion. I think that uh, the USSR breakup is not completely finished till nowadays because uh, four of 15 uh, states, former USSR republics, uh, have no diplomatic relations. Armenia and Azerbaijan, Russia and Georgia. Many uh, border disputes uh, unresolved, many conflicts open and latent. And I think when all conflicts would be resolved, all borders would be recognized, in this way we could speak about the end, the uh, end after the end, as Dennis uh, said some minutes ago, of the uh, USSR. But now we are witnesses of their dynamics of the uh, USSR breakup. I uh, 
think we need to differentiate the formal judicial fact, Belavezhia and Almata agreements, and the historical process. You know that uh, history of the Roman Empire collapse is not only agreement of Roma Augustul, and the French Revolution is not only assault of Bastille in 1789. The process, uh, the historical process of USSR collapse is continuing nowadays. In this fact, uh, addressing to de facto states is timely because uh, many, for many years those entities are considered in the context of uh, geopolitical competition or rivalry between US and Russia for uh, Eurasian space or through the prism of conflicts. Lack of cohesion, many corruption, and, and, and so on and so on, as Dennis uh, just uh, said. But uh, let's see on the experience of uh, UN members' countries. There are 193, and many of them are not self-sustainable. Many of these many are failed. But their states, uh, they have uh, their, their own uh, legitimacy and uh, maybe a wish to, to, to exist. I think that till nowadays the Eurasian space is a hostage of uh, USSR nation building approaches. You know that USSR was created by nationalists and was destroyed due to nationalism. And uh, uh, the USSR nation building approaches were based on the cult of ethnicity and the state primordialism when uh, ethnicity and uh, ethnic uh, uh, distinctions were registered on the territorial ground. This is why only naive uh, people could believe that collapse of USSR would be realized strictly according to the borders painted by the Bolsheviks, by the Comrade Stalin. It's not bad, it's not good. This is why conflicts, this is why problem of legitimacy, I think this problem is the most important. Not Russian support, not uh, corruption and so on. A request for self-determination. It concerns not only Georgia, Azerbaijan, Moldova, but Russia itself. Let's remember experience of Chechnya, experience of another uh, unrecognized states. We are speaking now de facto states, but de facto states is only one uh, type of unrecognized entities. Many entities were self-proclaimed after the USSR collapse. Only on the area of Karachay, Circassia, five entities were proclaimed in the August 1991. On the area of Dagestan, on the area of Azerbaijan, Talish Muganska Republic, and so on. But uh, many of them uh, didn't survive this self-proclamation. They had no resources. And due to different reasons, we are not discussing them. Chechnya was also an interesting uh, case of uh, self-determination and existence uh, like de facto states. Uh, this is why I think that the most important problem which uh, needs to be discussed is problem of uh, self-determination, motivation for this self-determination, problem of lack of legitimacy, and nation building. Projects, vulnerabilities, troubles, in the case of Georgia, Russia, Azerbaijan, or any uh, other countries of the uh, former USSR. Uh, I promised Kim uh, to uh, concentrate uh, on South Ossetia elections, uh, because I know this republic and I visited it many times. I have personal ties with uh, key actors of this uh, de facto entity. Uh, and uh, I would not speak uh, in details about uh, electoral arithmetic. It's available via internet, it's, it's possible to get acquainted, uh, to, to get acquainted on uh, it. I would uh, speak about uh, South Ossetia as the model for de facto states and the impact of this election for dynamics in uh, unrecognized uh, policies of the post-Soviet space. Uh, first of all, uh, my first thesis, uh, elections in South Ossetia uh, confirmed that uh, all those entities uh, have uh, their own domestic agenda and domestic development. Uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia are frequently compared, especially after 2008. Previously, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, were also compared in favor of Abkhazia and Nagorno-Karabakh. South Ossetia was uh, criticized and is criticized for a small number of people, for absence of democracy, for absence of resources, for statehood, and so on. Most of those arguments are right. 
But don't forget that uh, South Ossetia in uh, the mid of 90s uh, was uh, more advanced in the process of democratization than Abkhazia. Because after the Georgian Abkhaz conflict of 1993, uh, all resources, all power was concentrated in the hands of one man, Arzenba. Now many people, both in Russia and the West, uh, admire by the Abkhaz success, Abkhaz challenge to Kremlin in 2004-2005. But uh, don't forget that in South Ossetia till 2001, uh, some leaders changed. Eduard Kakoita changed Ludwig Chibirov. Ludwig Chibirov was appointee, was supported by Kremlin, not Kakoiti. Kakoiti won uh, his victory uh, through uh, the second round of elections. Now the story is repeated, not in all details, but a little bit repeated. Uh, because uh, that time, 10 years ago, Kakoiti was dark horse for South Ossetia. Uh, some models, because uh, since 1991 till uh, 1996, South Ossetia was uh, a mixture of Soviet and parliamentary republic model. And by the way, introduction of the president, uh, president position in 1996 was not supported by Moscow. Minister of Foreign Affairs criticized South Ossetia for this step, like step to final self-determination. Uh, and uh, ignoring delayed status of this republic. But uh, after 2004, agenda of uh, South Ossetia uh, was uh, uh, greatly oversimplified. Because South Ossetia at that time was in the conditions of unfreezing the conflict with Georgia. An agenda of this de facto state was very, very primitive. It was bipolar agenda. Enemies in front of our door, we need to be united, and, and, and so, so on, so on, blah, blah, looking like rhetoric of uh, Vladimir Putin currently. And uh, this is why uh, we uh, received a very simplistic agenda. But uh, recent elections showed that uh, there is another request in South Ossetia society. It's a request for more complex and complicated agenda. Because the most important question after 2008, when the Georgian factor has been marginalized, who would be the beneficiary of this self-determination? Not absolute self-determination, but self-determination from Georgia. Who would be beneficiary? Who would receive most important benefits from this uh, situation? Russian patronage, Russian uh, generous uh, financial aid, because since uh, August 2008 till uh, mid-2010, Russia paid uh, 15 billion rubles to South Ossetia. We have many disputes on the population of South Ossetia. 20,000, 70,000 different uh, options. It's not topic of my presentation today. But for comparison, uh, population of Stavropolia region is about 3 million. And annual budget of Stavropolia is 50 billion rubles. One third of annual budget of Stavropolia with three million people was paid by Moscow to South Ossetia. It's a huge amount of money. And uh, it's, it, it's a pity, but it's reality. Uh, some guys uh, around Kakoiti used the situation and transformed this financial aid to personal business project. But it's not interest for people living on the ground. And there is a contradiction between uh, businessmen, administrative businessmen, and uh, people who uh, believed really in self-determination. Yes, under the Russian uh, auspices, under the Russian uh, financial aid, uh, security guarantees, and so on. The same request was realized in Abkhazia in 2004, when Georgian factor was not so acute and topical. This situation was raised in Nagorno-Karabakh. And please uh, pay attention to uh, interesting uh, development. When a uh, factor of Azerbaijani challenge is thrown in, democracy is declining, or democratization is declining in Nagorno-Karabakh. When and where this factor is marginalized, uh, competitive uh, policy is more popular in Nagorno-Karabakh. It's an it's interesting, interesting situation. It's necessary to take into account. Uh, the next point, very important, uh, is uh, the role of Russia. This role is demonized many times in Georgia and in the West, 
But uh, I think it's, it's necessary to uh, really understand, uh, not for criticism, not for admiration, but really understand the rules of the game, which Russia realizes uh, in uh, South Ossetia and in, in Abkhazia. Um, here, uh, in South Ossetia, Russia realizes a very uh, familiar model, which uh, was realized previously in the North Caucasus. Russia is uh, criticized for its uh, North uh, Caucasus policy for extreme presence in the region. It's not so. This uh, uh, presence is limited, is restricted only by security agenda. As for soft power, smart power, no Russia in the region. The most important approach of Russia is uh, to ensure loyalty to Kremlin. If you are loyal, no problem. You would repeat uh, loyalty to Vladimir Putin five times a day instead of Namaz, which Ramzan Kadyrov demonstrates every day. But uh, really, presence of Russia, cultural, judicial, legal, is uh, close to zero. Practically, the same scenario is realized in South Ossetia, for elections and before elections. There is Eduard Kakoidi. He is our guy. He is loyal, extremely loyal to Russia. This is why we would close eyes for some violations of uh, uh, human rights and uh, some other uh, legal norms in this republic. The most important point is ensuring of loyalty. Uh, yes, Krem Kremlin uh, was not so uh, admired by Eduard Kakoiti because uh, officials uh, in Moscow uh, have known about his uh, administrative business activity. And this is why this August uh, Kremlin uh, sent uh, him a very clear message that third term would be not possible. And Kakoiti formally, visibly agreed on this situation. But at the same time, he began his own game. He appointed uh, Anatoly Bibilov as his successor. Before September, this name was not mentioned ever. He was not discussed like potential candidate. He was minister of emergency in South Ossetia, but he was not public politician. He was former paratrooper, very strong, smart guy, but he was not politically active. At the same time, some other candidates were uh, also supported by Kakoite and some towers of Kremlin, uh, because Kakoite was interested to have a very weak successor. And uh, Kakoite tried to realize a scenario close to Putin's tandem. I, I would be gone, but at the same time, I would exist. I would keep my position. This is why uh, this September Kakoite was uh, elected like uh, General Secretary of uh, Ruling Party Unity in South Ossetia. And uh, Anatoly Bibilov was proposed from this party. All things are understandable. But both Moscow and Kakoite uh, have not taken into account opposition in South Ossetia. Before those elections, this opposition looks, uh, looked like typical opposition in the post-Soviet countries, with recognition or without recognition. No leaders, no ideas. Every uh, guy pretends to be president, leader of the whole globe, and uh, no, no, no concrete programs, and so on. The uh, same scenario was realized in South City before September 2011. This is why Moscow, as well as Kakoiti, ignored absolutely opposition. This is why it was surprised to have Ala Jovoeva as the second uh, participant of the second round. Uh, who uh, obtained uh, 25 percentage of votes. But Ala Jovoeva uh, managed to accumulate protest votes and uh, uh, mobilize uh, different leaders of opposition. Uh, many popular figures in South Ossetia, like uh, Jabo Tadev, like Anatoly Barankevich, hero of the Five Days War of 2008, uh, who really was in Skinwali, unlike Eduard Kakoite, who... Uh-huh. Okay, okay. It's, it's, it's time to make, uh, make, uh, make conclusions. But I hope those details would be uh, interesting for, for, for discussion. Uh, and uh, in, in this way, nowadays, we have a situation not so good for Russia, because uh, nowadays, uh, position of Kakoite and his team in South Ossetia identif uh, identified with uh, the role of Russia. 
abolition of results, uh, intervention, administrative resource, and, and so on. I'm not sure that uh, this position is uh, uh, in favor of uh, Russian popularity. Uh, nowadays, Georgian government uh, would do nothing because Moscow and Kremlin uh, did uh, anything uh, to uh, disappointment in this position. Uh, finally, uh, I'm not sure that uh, status of South Ossetia would be uh, like state in five, ten years. I'm not sure that this statehood would be supported by any other countries. Maybe some countries of Oceania would join this uh, list of supporters. But uh, the number of supporters is not uh, extremely important. It's not crucially important thing. Uh, people on the ground must have interest for integration to Georgia or to Russia. It's the most important point in all political process. Ignorance of interests of people living in Abkhazia, South Ossetia, uh, it's counterproductive. It's not the argument. Uh, Abkhaz comprises 17% uh, of uh, pre-war Abkhazia. Abkhaz 17% plus 13% of Russians plus 15% of Armenians and so on. It's, it's necessary to understand this, uh, this, this problem. The problem is overcoming of uh, legacy of the Soviet Union and its approach to nation building, to the state primordialism. Because territorial integrity of Georgia, Azerbaijan, Moldova and Russia in the Soviet time was provided through the policy of CPSU and KGB and no uh, and other mechanisms are proposed to the people on the ground instead of KGB, CPSU, and state primordialism. It's necessary to find those conceptions, not PR programs, but real conceptions of nation building which would be attractive to the, uh, those peoples. In this way, we would be closer to the uh, finish of, uh, to the end of the USSR collapse. Thank you. Sergei, thank you so much. The details that you gave us about the relationship between the South Ossetian political figures is, is just, it brings really home uh, in a concrete level the kinds of abstract things that we're sometimes talking about, Thanks. so thank you. But I also touched some abstracts. You did, you <laughs> did, you did a good balance. Um, so now we're turning Deficit to... Deficit of the time. <laughs> now we'll turn, turn to uh, Gerard uh, Toal, who's Director of Government and International Affairs at Virginia Tech University in Alexandria. Um, he's a political geographer, and uh, so he's giving us a, a somewhat different perspective from what we've had up until this point. Um, he has a new book out from Oxford University Press called Bosnia Remade, Ethnic Cleansing and Its Reversal. And he's now taking his skills to apply them to the four Eurasian de facto states um, with funding from the National Science Foundation. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> okay, I have a um, presentation, a set of PowerPoint slides. And I have way too many slides and uh, not enough time. So I'm really going to have to zip, zip, zip. So I'm assuming you're reading. I see you're reading right now. That's very good. Um, let me underscore a few things. This is a, a national science, U.S. National Science Foundation project. It is purely scholarly. There's no policy recommendations coming out of this uh, particular project. It's a project which was uh, the um, uh, principal investigator of whom is Dr. John O'Loughlin at the University of Colorado. I'm a, a co-PI on the project. There's also a statistician and political scientist, Michael Ward, at Duke University, who is a PI on this particular project. Um, and what I want to present to you here um, is some comparative data on three of the Eurasian de facto states. Now, um, let me give you a definition, a scholarly definition of de facto states. So secessionist regions that have established internal territorial sovereignty but lack widespread recognition and legitimacy of states in the international system, and we're moving. Okay, the aims of the particular project. Um, this was a, a grant which was submitted in January 2008. Uh, just before Kosovo was to declare its uh, a unilateral declaration of independence, they, 
uh, proceeded to do that. Uh, the grant, uh, therefore, I think benefited tremendously from the timing of that. Um, and, and what we want to look at is three things. The, uh, how do de facto states endure? So it's kind of a question in scholarly leadership, uh, literature. And the role of internal legitimacy. Uh, obviously, uh, external support is absolutely vital. What, what role does internal legitimacy have? Then to look at the geopolitical ad, uh, attitudes in the wake of the Kosovo Declaration, and then, of course, sub subsequently unfolding the August War. Um, and then the third thing, given my own uh, background and interest in um, violence, return, and reconciliation questions in the Balkans, to um, look at the popular attitudes towards these particular questions. So the uh, surveys, um, there is a survey which is going to be conducted in Karabakh uh, in the next month or so. Um, but the surveys I want to present to you here um, have standardized questions across the different regions. And the categories of questions you can read uh, there from the particular slide. Now, there are massive methodological challenges doing research in de facto states. The question of access to uh, illegitimate regions which are uh, considered illegitimate um, by most states. Uh, the, per the question of getting permission to conduct survey research is very, very delicate and very uh, uh, difficult question. The population estimates are, as we have already seen, Dennis underscored, uh, are very, very uh, uh, loose. Um, the, we have to question the degree to which people are free to express their opinions in, in certain questions. There are certain, uh, also certain questions which are deeply sensitive, uh, and uh, they are occurring in a particular political context, which makes um, surveying quite difficult. The trust of the interviewers and the surveying firm, the quality of the surveying firm, also very, very important and, and challenging issues because in certain areas like South Ossetia, you really cannot get a series of surveying firms co competitively bidding on a particular project like what we have. And then the uh, last one, which is a very, very important one also, is the contested definition of identities, the, the question of Mingrelian and Georgian and the kind of fraught history of that in the, in the Georgian uh, context. So this is the first one, the public opinion survey in Abkhazia, which was conducted in late March, early April uh, 2010. Uh, and we uh, were able to secure the Levada Center to do that survey. Now, we had worked previously with the Levada Center in uh, 2006. Um, I'm looking at a survey which uh, was conducted in the North Caucasus. Um, and we went with the following estimates of the population. Uh, we had to do some adjustments on that. Um, overall, we're dealing with a, 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 a survey sample of 930. We dropped 70 um, because there were doubts about the honesty of the uh, respondents. Each one of the surveyors was asked to rate the honesty of the particular uh, surveyors, or the, the person taking the survey, um, and we felt that it was best to drop some um, because of uh, doubts about the honesty. Uh, and also mixed nationalities we dropped, there were very few of those. And I should all underscore, you know, how do we, how do we handle, we asked, we give people the, the choice of how they wanted to identify, so Georgian, Mingrelian, Georgian and Mingrelian, um, for the purposes of the survey, we have put together all of those categories into one uh, category, which is Georgian, you know, be, being, in, being aware that uh, we're, we're dealing with the populism that identified also as Mingrelian. Second survey uh, in uh, Transnistria was conducted in late June. Um, and um, this survey is a, as a sample size of uh, 975 and 12 locations. Uh, the person that we uh, um, developed a relationship with to conduct this survey was Dr. Elena Bobkova uh, in the Sociology Depart Department at Transnistria State University and the Russian Academy of Sciences. And she's had quite a lot of experience doing survey research in Transnistria. Um, so the different uh, ethnic groups in uh, Transnistria will uh, already be familiar to you. 
Third, uh, the public opinion survey in South Ossetia, which was conducted a year ago, uh, 506 respondents. Um, the population estimates are really quite uh, varied for South Ossetia, anything in the range of 17,000 to 50,000. Uh, the survey company we used uh, was uh, Professor Kazan Zutsev um, at the Institute of Sociology at Vladikavkaz, North Ossetia. Um, the particular sample, this, this really was a sample of Ossetians. Now, there are some Russians and some Georgians in that they are clearly married to Ossetians. And so, for all intents and purposes, um, this is an ethnic survey. It's a survey of Ossetians. Now, in, this, in the slides that I will show you, um, the South Ossetian sample is broken down into Ossetians and then others. Um, when we write this up, we're, we're actually just going to take out those that are Russian and Georgian because the, the, the sample is so small that it, you cannot make generalizations based on it. So effectively, we have to treat this as, a, as an ethnic uh, sample. Okay, so these are the categories of questions. There are 10 altogether. Um, and so I want to deal with security perceptions, internal disposition and legitimacy, geopolitical orientations. Now, you will find that, um, and uh, there's a, a last uh, set of slides which I could talk about if you want some more detailed uh, analysis, uh, and perhaps we could do that in the questions if you want to do that, which has to do with the disaggregation of some of the results by uh, socioeconomic demographic factors. Um, okay. So first, number one, did you or a close uh, family member witness a violent event that resulted in death and severe injury during the recent war? Now, a lot of this will not be surprising to you, but let's just look at the particular results here. So amongst ethnic APCAS in our survey, over 70 uh, percent. Um, then uh, Armenian, uh, really strong uh, with Armenians, uh, less so amongst Georgians. Um, in the case of the South Ossetia survey, very, very high scores. As you know, the uh, number of deaths in the, uh, the formation of Transnistria was much less. Just this, the importance of this slide is to underscore something that uh, is, has already been mentioned, uh, which is the legacy of violence and the experience, the direct personal experience of people with violence and the enduring power of that. Um, now, the, what are the chances of more war? The survey was conducted in 2010. One of the things that's really striking about the results here is the degree to which um, uh, the folks in Abkhazia, the respondents in Abkhazia and in South Ossetia, see that the, the chances of a new war are small or there's no problem at all of a new war. That, I think, is a direct consequence of the fact that there are Russian troops. Well, the, the August war unfolded the way it did. They are now, um, the, one could argue it's recognition, but I think it has more to do with the fact there are Russian troops on the ground, Russian troops at the border, uh, and then there are the relationships developed um, with Russian uh, troops. You'll see in South Ossetia there's more concern about war than there is in, uh, in Abkhazia. Now, what is striking is why in Transnistria there are um, significant results, that are, a significant part of the population thinks that there's a big or a very big chance of war. One explanation for that, I think, is in part the nature of the Transnistrian regime, which of course has a very other-centered, uh, kind of Soviet-style conception of the enemy. And remember, in Moldova at that time, uh, Mikhail Gimpru was the president, uh, the, na the, the liberal uh, nationalist. And in April of that year, he had pointedly refused to go to the 55th anniversary of the end of World War II uh, in Moscow. And there was a big dispute about it, and he was called, or compared to Hitler, by one of the uh, uh, people in the Russian Duma. And uh, the, uh, w 
the, that particular anniversary is a major deal in Transnistria. And so you can see how the regime there and the media outlets in Transnistria would be able to kind of whip that up into uh, something which uh, sort of reinforces Soviet-style conceptions of, a, the, uh, of an enemy and the threat. That's my explanation, and perhaps there, there may be some others. But there certainly is a degree of insecurity. Was the end of the Soviet Union a right or wrong step? Um, the um, degree to which it is uh, considered to be a wrong step is uh, astoundingly clear from these particular uh, um, graphs. What is the current direction of the country? Um, as you can see, amongst ethnic Abkhaz, very, very happy with the particular state of situation. The Armenians, too, uh, Georgian Mingrelians, uh, that I do not know, refuse to answer. Um, most of those are surveyed, um, that the Georgian Mingrelian population was surveyed in the Gali district, but not completely. Um, the high, the do not know, refuse to answer is, is exactly an indicator of the problem of doing uh, survey research, especially in sensi uh, about, uh, asking sensitive questions uh, in um, de facto states. And I can talk a lot more about that particular issue. Um, as you can see, there's a little less uh, uh, concern with the Soviet Union or generally, there's mi mixed uh, results in the case of Transnistria. Or Transnistria. Actually, the there's quite a bit of concern that the country is on the wrong footing, and that comes out in some of the other results. What is the best political system? The Soviet is in red. The current system is in yellow. Western democracy is in blue. Um, and um, it's very striking in Transnistria. The Soviet system wins out very clearly. In South Ossetia, also very clearly, not in Abkhazia where the current system, um, which is, as has been underscored, uh, um, an ethnocracy of sorts by, uh, dominated by the ethnic Abkhaz, is a system which, is, uh, which has widespread legitimacy amongst the ethnic Abkhaz. Less so amongst the Armenians and um, certainly a lot less amongst the Georgian population. Now, we asked the question about the degree to which uh, people can trust people of other nationalities. Do you agree or disagree with this opinion? I put this slide in here because it, it underscores the degree to which officially these countries, or not countries, these de facto states, these, the people in these areas uh, hold a, a political culture which, which is sort of Soviet, uh, in inspiration and sees itself as anti-ethnocratic. So the official culture is that they are uh, mobilizing against ethnocratic nationalistic projects in their mother uh, or in their, their former uh, mother state. Um, how long should Russian troops remain in the country? Um, we give them three options. They should remain forever. Uh, they should leave when the situation improves or when the situation normalizes, and they should withdraw now. Um, and um, again, obviously a very sensitive question. As you can see, very strong scores for them remaining forever. Um, we wanted to pick up the, and the degree of sort of ambivalence about that. Now that's maybe a very sensitive question and it may be difficult to, to get, that, that's a, that a surface initial um, response to a particular prompt. That the actual uh, attitudes of people uh, when you drill down may be more complicated and there's more, uh, and uh, without doubt they're more complicated and, and more nuanced. Do you trust the present Russian leadership? You know, this is, uh, um, striking the, the sets of results on that, um, as you might expect, amongst the Georgian population in Abkhazia, and um, high do not know, refuse to answer, and a, a number who um, felt free enough to say no, that they do not. 
What is your preferred political future? Unity with Russia, be part of the parent state, uh, or independence? Amongst uh, Abkhaz, ethnic Abkhaz, independence by far is their uh, preferred uh, solution. Interestingly, amongst Armenians in Abkhazia, their preferred solution is not independence, but joining Russia. Um, uh, counterintuitively, amongst the Russian population within Abkhazia, they are in favor of independence. Um, the results uh, from the Georgian Mingralians here has to be treated with, with a degree of caution, uh, and I can say more about that uh, later. Uh, in the case of the Ossetians, uh, you know, unambiguous about the fact that independence is not something that is desirable. What is desirable is joining the uh, Russian Federation. Now that actually is a composite, that unity with Russia is a composite of, uh, of two answers because we give them the option of joining as part of North Ossetia, in other words in a sort of unified Ossetia Alania, or joining as a separate um, ethnic republic uh, like North Ossetia. And uh, results were split uh, amongst those two options. The forgiveness question. Um, some people say they cannot forgive others for the violence they committed, agree or not with this opinion. This is the testing in part the degree to which there is reconciliation potential. Um, so if you definitely agree with this, then you are in the unforgiving category. You are sort of uh, comfortable being irreconciled. Uh, to the uh, particular, <coughs> uh, your enemy. And as you can see, there's strong support for this amongst the Abkhaz, uh, ethnic Abkhaz, less amongst the Russians, strong support amongst the uh, Ossetians. Um, the uh, situation in Transnistria is uh, much more uh, favorable uh, as one might expect. So what, what are uh, some conclusions here? Um, this, I've given you a lot of data here. Um, uh, there are six points uh, that I, I have come up with here, uh, which um, I hope you're now reading. Uh, what I want to underscore is the degree to which there has, the legacy of violence is extremely important in this area. The sense of victimhood is also extremely important. Um, the shared sense of loss, the collapse of the Soviet Union is very, very important. And we sh should see that uh, the Soviet Union is really as a metonym for um, a, a form of development for a state which was strong, which was prosperous. Uh, now, of course, there's nostalgic golden era conception um, but it's also uh, something that's, that's very, very powerful and very real there on the, uh, amongst the, within the political cultures of these different areas. I've mentioned the self-conception of these places as anti-ethnocracies, but of course that has tremendous contradictions because if you ask about ethnic pride in these areas, it's off the charts. If you ask about the degree to which they are, are open to people coming back, there's tremendous hostility to uh, people coming back to returns and the like. Uh, and there is in practice an ethnocracy, uh, ethnocratic um, features of these states, uh, or at least in Abkhazia and, and South Ossetia. Um, strong orientation towards Russia, strong trust of the Russian leadership, trust of the local leadership varies. Uh, it is really quite low in, Trans, in Transnistria, high in Abkhazia. It's mixed in South Ossetia. And some of the other results in South Ossetia indicate that there is about 40, 40, I was looking at it last night, between 40 and 48 percent of the population in South Ossetia really see those in power as basically uh, a group that are out for themselves. Uh, and are not, do not have the interests of uh, ordinary people um, in, their, um, in their hearts. Um, variable perception of right, wrong, and, um, and I can talk about the degree to which age and purchasing power, these divides uh, are 
a, a significant to the extent that you can have significant intra-ethnic significances. I want to leave you with this particular a memorial which is on the Tsar Road in South Ossetia to uh, an event in, in May of 1992 when a number of Ossetians died as a consequence of shelling. And I, I want to leave with this image to underscore not the degree to which Ossetians are victims, but the degree to which people in the region generally see themselves as victims. And as a consequence, uh, base their politics around that. Uh, and of course, with victimhood comes a sort of uh, irreconcilable po uh, politics, a self-righteous politics, and all of these make it very difficult to begin to negotiate what are uh, kind of complex legacies of violence in the area. Okay, thank you. So if we could ask the panel to come back up. Thank you, Gerard, for that terrific presentation and sharing of your research. Um, what I'd like to do now is open up the floor to questions, and because this is on the record with um, all uh, responses being recorded uh, for the website, I would ask people who have questions to please line up before the microphone that is in the uh, center of the room. And if you have a question, please first identify yourself so that we know who you are. And please make it a question, not a statement. Um, and please make it brief. And uh, then we'll uh, allow the respondents uh, uh, on the panel to respond. So again, please come up uh, before the microphone here if you have a question. Um, I'm Peter Samnaby, the former EU Special Representative for the South Caucasus. I have a, a quick question uh, to, uh, to Gerard Toll, the last uh, presentation. You ended um, with a powerful image here of uh, victimhood. There are obviously other victims also that are not covered uh, by your surveys. I Obviously, as a practitioner here, I would be interested in, in seeing how this, uh, these very interesting results could be used uh, as a basis for policy making as well. And in that perspective, I would like to ask you uh, whether you also have considered and made an attempt to, to make similar uh, surveys among the population that was not <coughs> covered here, that is the, the IDP population from um, uh, South Ossetia and Abkhazia. Do you want to go ahead and respond? Thank you, Peter, for that question. Uh, that is actually a perfect uh, setup for um, this particular article, which is forthcoming, um, that I wrote with uh, Magdalena Frikova Grono um, on uh, attitudes of, uh, of current Abkhazians and displaced Abkhazian Georgians. Uh, and what we did is we took the Conciliation Resources Survey, um, which was conducted in 2010 of IDPs in Georgia and put that together with um, the um, attitudes of Abkhazians today. And we're particularly interested in the question of return, which is something that, uh, as, as mentioned, I, I wrote a book on in, in, in Bosnia. Um, and you're welcome to, to get a, a, um, a look at this. Um, the, it's very important. Of course there are victims, uh, other uh, victims. I mean, I was kind of underscoring the degree to which this is a whole central issue that needs to be confronted and uh, kind of theorized and thought about uh, carefully and dealt with very, very sensitively. Um, the results of that conciliation resources survey are really quite astounding in, in lots of ways. Um, and um, we're now doing some work in uh, Karabakh. W what was striking to me is the degree to which um, displaced Georgians, IDPs, knew about the status of their property in Abkhazia. Um, and the degree to which they also indicated that they would not go back if Abkhazia was not part of Georgia. Um, the po in terms of policy recommendations, one of the issues that uh, I have um, 
learned from studying Bosnia is the degree to which we have to think about return within the context of five hours of reconstruction, which are uh, kind of five hours of post-conflict reconstruction, uh, which physical reconstruction, but also restitution, uh, also uh, reconciliation, uh, and um, the question of return has to be contextualized within all of those. There is an essay that I wrote for Conciliation Resources uh, for their project, Forced Displacement in the Nagorno-Karabakh Conflict. There's a, a publication that's just come out, uh, which tries to get at some of those areas. What I uh, hint at in this particular paper is the degree to which the restitution issue is one that potentially could become a basis for um, some kind of movement amongst the parties. The Pinheiro principles are United Nations principles which seek to, the, in part generated out of the experience in Bosnia, which seek to put in place a depoliticized a commission, a sort of technocratic commission, to try to deal with property issues um, and to try to have some kind of a, um, system whereby people can uh, begin to get their property back. Um, in the one of the interesting um, results from the South Ossetia survey is we asked, have Ossetians benefited from Georgian property? And there was like one third, like, I think it was like over one third of the respondents said yes, that they had. So there was, there was consciousness amongst the Ossetians that they were taking, um, they were benefiting from the property that belong to other people. And in Bosnia, one of the uh, real successes of the Office of the High Representative was the media campaigns that they put together to try to inculcate in people the idea that the property that you're living in after Dayton is not your property, it belongs to someone else, and it's time to go home. It's time to get your property back. Now, you don't have to necessarily go back and live in uh, the Federation if you're a displaced Serb in, in Republic of Serbska, but you have the right to get your property back, and you can sell that property, and that's something that you can make an individual decision about. Um, that's giving you some rights. That's providing a mechanism whereby you can begin to have some sort of resolution even if it is a resolution where you're deciding to uh, remain, to locally integrate in your place of displacement. Terrific. That's positive. Okay, Thank you. Sorry. Yes, uh, Craig Oliphant, um, formerly the uh, British Foreign Office and now uh, working for Safer World, an NGO in London. I'd like to add my thanks to the whole panel for the overview you gave. I've got a couple of questions, um, one for Dennis Sanat and one for Sergei Makadonov. Dennis, you, uh, in terms of your three stages, I wondered if I could invite you to um, uh, put your um, forward-looking cap on. And I suppose in terms of the role of Russia and uh, the key role I think that, that has come through in all of the panel presentations, with the probability or well-nigh certainty that Putin is coming back uh, in 2012, do you uh, see that third stage you described uh, as morphing into possibly something else? Uh, or do you think that we're stuck with the third stage well nigh into the, the sunset now? So that would be uh, one question. And to Sergei, thank you very much for your comments um, uh, and insights on the South Ossetian elections. I wondered if you could just compare and contrast uh, Russia's stance and reaction to the Abkhaz uh, de facto mm -hmm. elections that took place. Did you get a sense that uh, Moscow was relatively relaxed, uh, whether it was going to be um, uh, Sergei Shamba or Alexander Ang Angkrab? Mm -hmm. uh, well, of course, looking to the future is much more difficult than looking at the past. Um, I, uh, I want to give the Russian leadership the benefit of the doubt. We've had over the last few days, last month particularly, quite a lot of uh, interesting statements, uh, creation of a new Eurasian Union, the possibility of <coughs> others joining this union, and uh, uh, 
also a, a, a reinterpretation of the Russian intervention in South Ossetia in 2008, uh, which has been given a completely new twist by President Medvedev when talking to the 58th Army in Vladikavkaz a few days ago. Uh, I, uh, I, as I said, I, I want to give the Russian leadership the benefit of the doubt in the sense that this is election time uh, in Russia and uh, politicians say a lot of things when they are in, uh, 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 during elections. Um, my feeling is that there is uh, a general movement towards trying to reconsolidate uh, countries that want to, to cooperate with Russia into some kind of formal arrangement for the future. And it seems to me that this is now on the agenda. I don't think that the international situation or even the desire <coughs> of the Russian leadership at the moment is to try to force anybody to join who does not want to join. Uh, but, you know, these issues tend to also to, to, to go into some gray areas sometimes because uh, you can have a situation where a country is uh, going to a difficult moment, either economically or politically or in instability, and we've ha we have a lot of that in the former Soviet space. Uh, so we're entering, in a sense, in a new, in a new uh, point where we're crossing a, a, a line, I think, uh, and it will take another few months until the political situation settles down, uh, until we actually see whether, what form the, this will take. But I'm very keen to hear what Sergei will have to say about this, because I think he, he has... He, thank, he thank, 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 you, thank you, Craig, for your question, and thank you, Dennis. Uh, as a Russian uh, political analyst, I could not ignore the question on Putin's role. As for me, the uh, problem of Putin's comeback is not an option, because he left anything. In order to speak about comeback, it's necessary to leave anything before. Putin was key actor for the last three years, and he would be, I'm not sure how many years exactly, but it's not a uh, principal uh, decision. It m it's maybe a symbol. It's possible to play with the symbol inside Russia and outside of Russia, uh, mobilizing some fear, so uh, on the contrary, pacifying the people. All would be stable and, and, and so on and so on. But it's not, uh, it's not an option. And I'm not sure that the uh, course of Dmitry Medvedev was uh, principal different from Putin's approach to a, a, any conflicts uh, in the Eurasia or to de facto states. As for your uh, second question on uh, differences in the Russian approach to Abkhazia and South Ossetia, uh, it's, it's a pity for me, uh, but uh, it's, it's a great problem uh, in Russia because uh, people in the Kremlin uh, are not interested to hear from uh, advisors, uh, scholars, and this is why they uh, like to repeat uh, their own mistakes. In the case of Abkhazia, Kremlin really understood. It's impossible to realize such scenarios uh, which uh, were realized in 2004-2005. Yes, for Abkhazian case, this understanding is. But for South Ossetia, no. It would be necessary to survive the same experience to understand on the case of South Ossetia. This scenario is not so good. Maybe for the next elections for South Ossetia, this experience would be not repeated. It's, 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 it's a problem, it's a problem. I think that uh, people in the Kremlin uh, really uh, mix two uh, uh, perceptions. Patriotism and defense of the Russian national interest and personal loyalty to Putin. For Putin and Kremlin, uh, patriots are not so interesting. Loyalists, but having loyalists have uh, those results like you have in South Ossetia. Please line up on the microphone. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Sabine Fischer from the European Union Institute for Security Studies. I think this is a great panel. Thank you very much. Um, I have three questions. The first goes to uh, Lawrence. Um, I mean, this was really a very interesting state of the art, actually, of uh, current research on uh, the situation in the unrecognized uh, territories. And at the end, you said that this research is in an impasse. and the reasons you gave for that impasse were mainly political, the recognition of Kosovo, the recognition of Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and the defeat of the Tamil Tigers. Now this points to, in my view, to a politicization of this field of research. And we all know that this politicization exists, and it's a big problem because as your research and as, as uh, Gerard's presentations 
uh, presentation has shown, it's really important to have this research on the situation inside uh, the conflict, uh, or inside the conflict lines. So my question is, do you see a way out of this situation? What, what should happen to, to, be, to enable us to, to, uh, to do more of this research? The second question goes to uh, Dennis, and it also touches upon Russia's role and, and policy. Um, you said that under uh, Putin in the 2000s, um, the support for Abkhazia and South Ossetia um, became an end in itself. Um, and I agree with you. But what I would like to have clarification on is what exactly is Russia's objective with this policy? Um, I mean, in the Western discourse, we very often hear that basically Russia is mainly interested in creating the conditions for, the pre for its military presence in these areas. Is that it? or is there more to it? And it would be great if Sergei could also say a few words about that. And lastly, um, to um, Gerard. Um, very interesting, thank you very much. Um, and you said during your presentation that you could say a little bit more about your results in the um, Mingrelian Georgian Gali region, and I would indeed be very interested in that because I found some of the charts very, very interesting in that respect, particularly um, the responses you got on uh, the question of independence and the presence of Russian troops. Thank you very much. Thanks. Is there anyone else who wishes to ask a question because we're running low on time and so I think because there's a question for each mm -hmm. respondent, maybe we should gather questions. Marina? Um, thank you very much for the panel. Marina Murani um, Zemichel, Princeton Partnership for Policy Research. I have um, a question to Sergei. As you mentioned, um, in the 90s, Ossetia was in advanced economic uh, position compared not to economic political 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 not not economic okay political uh, position and uh, as you also know at that time it was a uh, free access freer access for example to uh, Ossetia versus to Abkhazia from Georgian side mm -hmm. and my question is do you think that sort of open borders and it's of course you know a statement which didn't exist uh, somehow contributed to that more uh, advanced uh, political position okay. for Ossetia. Thank you. Economic role in the reconciliation. Right. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Inga Snip, Uppsala University. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one sort of goes in line with what uh, Sabina just was asking. It's to Lawrence also. Um, there is a discrepancy, it seems, between um, uh, different goals and different means. Uh, it's understandable that a state wants to um, get its territory where it used to be and um, doesn't want to agree with its internally displaced people not being able to go back. Um, but on the other hand, there should be a solution should be found to the situation. So how do you, in your work, deal with this? I, I'm just curious. How are you able to, to, uh, to overcome these, these, these differences? And my second question is to um, Gerard. Um, I was wondering, is there any data available on the perceptions of uh, Ossetians, Moldovans, um, and Abkhaz, or at least from the, these territories, uh, from before like uh, 10 years ago or at 20 years ago, to see, like it would be super interesting, of course, to like, um, compare these things, but I understand that there might not be data available. Um, and if it's not, how, how, how would you find a way to, to somehow still compare uh, perceptions and views of identity and uh, a reconsider, a reconciliation? Thank you very much. Okay, so there's a lot on the table, and I would just ask us to go down the line um, with each individual panelist uh, answering questions. So uh, there were two questions about the politicization um, of scholarship, of inquiry into uh, de facto states, um, and how do we move on from that. Um, I think there's, there's different uh, angles to answering that question. Um, one angle is that it is also, of course, of uh, interest to policymaking communities. What is going on um, in de facto states? What, is, uh, what are the internal processes? Because that can then contribute um, to more effective policy. Policy that is uh, um, conducted or that is um, elaborated in a vacuum um, can be often, of course, very ineffective um, and not just ineffective in its own terms but quite destructive and producing unexpected and unwanted um, outcomes. So 
Um, there is a, a necessary process, I think, for scholars who want to work on de facto states of remaining engaged um, with the uh, communities in, in the de jure states, in the metropolitan states, um, and that's also a process of assuring uh, motives, um, that motives are bona fide, um, and uh, scholarly integrity is actually a key aspect to that. Um, that if you are going to work um, uh, on these issues, you really have to make sure that you um, uh, preserve uh, your, your integrity and, 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 and don't, take, uh, don't take sides. Um, I think another route out of the impasse um, is that uh, over time, um, I think I, I hinted at this in the presentation, um, we'll see um, that uh, uh, quickly imposed solutions, uh, military solutions, um, uh, will not solve uh, the problem. So, um, you know, right now uh, there's a, a lot of euphoria, I think, in, in Sri Lanka with regard to uh, Tamil Lilam, um, but we'll see over time um, how and in what way um, the uh, root problems uh, will resurface, and that means that we need to have a continued engagement um, in, in the scholarly sphere. So I think, um, it is an important variable to what extent are uh, policy communities and academic communities converging um, in their analysis. And I think those are the moments when uh, something interesting can happen. Um, uh, and then there are the moments when they di diverge. And I think we're in that phase right now. Um, but I think it will come together again. Yes, uh, I think to answer this question, I, I want uh, again to refer to a speech that, that uh, Medvedev uh, made a few days ago, I think, at the, at the Congress of United Russia, um, uh, in which he kind of uh, talked about uh, why the Russians want this kind of bigger project around them, whether it was the Soviet Union or something else in the future. And it was interesting uh, uh, to hear this view because uh, it kind of uh, confirms that there is still this uh, yearning for a role that is bigger than, than the nation itself. Uh, many of us who have watched this for some time thought that, that this was past tense, but it, apparently it's still, it's still part of the, of the Russian discourse. Uh, but tangibly, uh, I think we have now a clear picture of what, what um, uh, Russian officials want uh, from, from the post-Soviet space. One, they want to deny it to anybody else. I think this is the first uh, objective. They, so the, the idea that you can't have NATO expansion, uh, you can't have foreign troops on <laughs> on the land of the former Soviet Union. This now is, you know, it, it, it's, it's emerging as, as official state policy now. Uh, the issue of uh, the military bases, uh, I think uh, the, the most important military bases by far are the ones in Abkhazia. Uh, uh, because uh, they they are part of the uh, of the overall strategy of uh, uh, you know of the Black Sea. Abkhazia was always an important uh, uh, military base, and it remains so. And now, with uh, these long-term military agreements, uh, this 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 is confirmed. The military base in South Ossetia has always been you know questionable. In, you know, South Ossetia there isn't even a proper airport uh, where you can land planes because of the geography. Um, you know, the sustaining South Ossetia, you know, the vulnerability of the Rocky Tunnel always will always remain an issue. Uh, so South Ossetia uh, is not an important in itself. But of course, if the thinking in, uh, in Moscow is still to perceive uh, Tbilisi as an enemy uh, or a potential enemy or a potential place uh, where danger can come from, uh, and I want to ask people to remember the Let's go back to 1999 uh, when the operation uh, in Chechnya uh, took place because at the time there were some very clear statements made by, by, by Russian generals about why they needed to secure uh, Georgia and, and Azerbaijan, some very, very close statements, uh, which at the time you know, perhaps were not given so much importance because the focus was on what was going on in Chechnya itself. But they, they, they're starting to fall into place and actually create a picture. Uh, you need to understand the geography uh, of the thing. At, at the moment, there are Russian troops literally uh, you know, a few meters away from the road that connects East Georgia with West Georgia. Uh, and, and this was the, the most crucial bit during the, the uh, August war. Uh, that, uh, you know, if, if the Russians had actually uh, occupied that road, 
then they would have cut the country in two, uh, and that would have created a completely different uh, dynamic. Uh, and so what South Ossetia gives uh, Russia in military terms is, is the possibility of actually being there uh, and doing this if it wants to. Uh, I'm not saying that it wants to, but I'm, I'm just saying that with the rhetoric as it is at the moment, uh, there are questions that uh, one needs to ask. And this rhetoric, uh, I'm not introducing this rhetoric myself. I'm, I'm just uh, reacting in a way to a lot of things that have been said over the last few weeks uh, by Russian leaders. As I said, maybe we need to give them the benefit of the doubt because it's election time, uh, but on these very sensitive issues, uh, I think we cannot ignore them either. No, no, I don't question uh, anything. I, 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 I will take it. I will take it at face value uh, uh, in in the context in which he said it. Okay. Thanks. Two questions. The first one is on the Russian policy and uh, its priority. The second about transparent borders and its role in the conflict resolution. I think that uh, Russian policy uh, has uh, three very serious lacks: lack of verbalization lack of formalization, lack of explanation. This is why uh, Russian rhetoric is perceived like real Russian policy, especially in the West when people are not really interested to uh, study nuances, details. Don't forget that currently for United States, Russia is not the first rank power like USSR. It's so pleasant in Russia to think in this way, but in reality it's far from the, from the reality. Uh, I think we need to differentiate some uh, personal deals, some complexes, stereotypes of Vladimir Putin and Dmitry Medvedev and some Russian uh, real national interests. It's not the same. Sometimes it's the same, but sometimes no. Dennis told that South Ossetia is not uh, very important for Russia, or maybe it's important to control Georgia, but I, I'm not sure that real aim of Russia is to cut Georgia in two, two times. Uh, South Ossetian conflict is very important for Russia because uh, this conflict is connected directly with the Ossetian and Gush conflict in its dynamics. This conflict was the first ethno-political conflict in Russia and the dynamic of Georgian Ossetian conflict influenced greatly on the Russian situation. South Caucasus is uh, the unique region for Russia because unlike Central Asia, unlike Ukraine, Baltic countries, this uh, area really effects on this domestic situation in Russia. It's necessary to take into account. As for NATO, it's first and foremost for uh, babushka, dedushka, voters for Putin's majority and Russian uh, uh, elder population. I'm not seriously considering uh, this uh, situation. As, as for NATO, as, as I see, the problem uh, with Georgia, not NATO itself, because Russia cooperated with NATO and now cooperates with NATO in many, many aspects, many topics, and, and so on. By the way, I think uh, the one of the most important reasons for Five Days War is Georgian miscalculations in the Russian NATO cooperation. And necessity for this cooperation uh, in the both sides. But uh, fear of Russia and phobia of Russia related and relates to a NATO-like instrument for reconsideration of the uh, conflicts in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. Unfreezing of the conflicts. It's the case when a uh, tail uh, will tag the dog. In this situation, NATO was perceived like challenge, not NATO itself. NATO stands in the Russian borders in the Baltic countries and no problem, no hesitation because the Baltic countries uh, don't influence directly on the Russian domestic security agenda. As for transparent borders, you are absolutely right that uh, since 1992 to 2004, South Ossetia was uh, different from Abkhazia. Even in the constitution of de facto South Ossetia, Georgian language was recognized like official language. It was unbelievable in, in Abkhazia. Georgian lives in South Ossetia and uh, a small market in Gori, closer to Garissihi, was called Asitinka. I was there sometimes, and the uh, uh, problem of passportization at that time concerned uh, more uh, to Georgian 
population, because many of Georgians were businessmen, taxi drivers, and the cost of taxi uh, from Tsinvali to Tbilisi was pretty modest, 600 rubles, 20, 25 dollars. You could share this taxi with uh, another passenger, you could pay 600 rubles and uh, to ask driver to stop, to make pictures, and, and so on. Uh, I think it was uh, very effective due to Dagomis Agreement. I think the Dagomis Agreement of 1992 was very effective. It was really a compromise between all conflict sites, and uh, it really ensured 20 to 12 years of peaceful life, which was useful for both sides, for assets, for Georgians, for Georgia, for Russia. But uh, in 2004, a uh, policy of unfreezing of the conflict was launched. Now I am not going to uh, blame or to accuse anybody, but in my personal point of view, it was uh, maybe a miscalculation from the success of Ajaria. In 2004, I wrote a special article about Saakashvili as a hostage of Ajarian success. But South Ossetia was a very uh, different case. And unfreezing of the conflict was a mistake finally, for all sides involved in this conflict. As for your question, yes, I, I really understand, understand that transparent borders are better than closed borders, than New Berlin walls or some other walls. But it's a result of the conflict. It's uh, so sensitive now. Uh, it's kind of a uh, very strong psychological effect, especially in South Ossetia. I talked with m many people in 2005, 2006. Um, practically all people repeated that time in 2007, 2008, uh, one phrase. We believe that Georgians changed after 1992, but 2004 events demonstrated us another proofs. This is why I'm not sure that transparent borders would be a uh, short-term uh, prospect for South Ossetia, but it would be better for all sides. Thanks, Sergei. And Gerard, you get the last word. OK. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for uh, the question, Sabine. Um, on politicization, a um, very important issue, very difficult issue. Uh, the law on occupied territories uh, did not exist when uh, we first conceived this research. And uh, um, um, you know, the Oryx War hadn't happened. Uh, and um, frankly, I don't know whether this uh, research could be criminalized as a consequence of that particular law or not. I'm still, we're seeking sort of clarification on that particular issue, I, I hope not. Um, the second issue uh, on Gali, Gali District, very, very difficult research environment. Uh, and we tried to address this in the post-Soviet affairs article inside Abkhazia, which came out in January of this year. Um, the Gali population are really caught between uh, two fires or between two uh, poles of uh, power. Um, and their mode of dealing with that is to try to not identify. And so you have a strong do not know, refuse to, uh, to answer, which I think actually in some ways is, is a, a very important finding, a very important uh, result. In terms of the, the independence, it's worth underscoring the majority of the population in this particular survey in, of the Georgians do not support the independence of Ocasio. Um, um, but there, uh, there is a proportion of the population that in this particular survey did choose, did s indicate that they support that. Now, does that mean that they really do? I think you have to treat that with caution. I think that you can make the argument that if they cross the border and go into Georgia proper, they would give a different answer. Now, and we also must remember in Georgia too, there are pressures because some people see people going back to Abkhazia as traitors uh, and uh, in some way supporting uh, the Abkhaz project, Abkhazia, Abkhazia as a project. So it's a very difficult environment. Uh, and we just have to, to kind of bear that in mind. The, the, the Inga's question about the comparative issue. Um, there is a survey in Transnistria, John O'Loughlin and Vladimir Kolosov. I did a survey about 10 years ago or so. And so their research, when, when we went there, they were in part following up on an earlier research. Um, what I would say is that 
uh, but in, in Abkhazia, South Ossetia, I, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, but what I say is this survey is, uh, this research is a marker for 10 years from hence when uh, folks can go back into the Gali district and elsewhere and ask the same questions and they see the degree to which uh, there's been movement and the degree to which uh, one can begin to explore these issues. But public opinion surveys have significant limitations and we need to bear that in mind. The best way to do research is ultimately to do sort of ethnographic research and do focus groups uh, and that's where you're going to get the, the complexity uh, and the depth and the nuance that uh, is important to capture uh, about these particular areas. Thanks. Thank you. We've gone a few minutes over, so I'd ask people to take a relatively quick break so we can regather again at 11.15. And please join me in thanking this outstanding panel. Thank you.